Hi everyone, thanks very much for joining me in this meeting room um, to discuss building truly platform agnostic graphical user interfaces with Fine. Uh, my name is Andrew Williams. You might know me from previous projects such as the Maven build system or the Enlightenment Foundation libraries and, and Window Manager, but if not, that's okay. Uh, I'm a, I've been a software engineer for nearly 20 years be working in open source and recently got into um, entrepreneurship, uh, being an author on the topic of graphical user interfaces, and I've been developing Fine and Go since 2018. I have a bit of a confession, this is the first time that I've spoken at Open Source Summit, though it's really helpful, uh, really exciting to be here. It'd be helpful to gauge for this talk um, people's familiarity with things. So is there anybody in the room that knows the Go programming language? No? That's cool. Has <laughs> that, that's, that, that's great, yeah, absolutely. Some, some familiarity is helpful, but it's not essential. Um, has anybody built a graphical user interface for any applications? Excellent, okay, yep, yeah, that's cool. So you'll understand some of the things, uh, some of the directions that I'm coming from. And does anybody who doesn't say yes to either of those have familiarity with C or some other programming language that, that might be utilized? Okay, awesome. So there might be a couple of things in here that aren't super familiar, but I'll try and explain those as we, as we go along. <clears throat> so the concept of building a graphical user interface is complicated and it sits in a legacy of 25, 30 years uh, of, of history about how things came around. They're complicated for a lot of people coming in first time based in the C programming language, which is not, let's face it, the easiest one to build with. You have to think about memory management and thread handling. Is my code running in the right location at the right time? If I cleared the memory, am I handing it to somebody else? All sorts of things that aren't really a problem if you start building with web technologies and other approaches. And so you can see why perhaps native application development has been left a little bit in the past. And when you compare that to modern programming languages, we don't even have think things like good string handling or templates, things that can really help us to put together a more complicated user interface. Now, of course, there's plenty of languages that have come since, but they are not all really embracing let's build this correctly. There's plenty of uh, opportunities to access graphics in other programming languages, but they're commonly building um, on bindings from existing technologies, which means we get the nice programming language on top, but we don't really get a new way of thinking about things. Building in this way and on top of legacy technologies or existing libraries can be difficult to learn. There's a lot of complicated things and the API you're interacting with might not match your understanding of how the programming language is set up, which is going to add a lot of overhead to, to the learning and to maintaining the code. And the excellent toolkits that are out there that have tried to solve this in the past do come along with this 20, 25 year of baggage, which makes them really featureful. <clears throat> but does mean it's a little bit difficult to get started. I'm not going to name any names, but you might find that the download is 10 gigabytes. You need 40 gigabytes on your hard drive. That's going to take a while to do anything before you can get started. And then there's a lot of setup required as well. So actually, I'm here to tell you that the Go programming language is a really fantastic fit here. It may not have built-in toolkits, but it happens to be a really great fit. You're the applications that you build are designed to be written once and run anywhere. The compiler just understands all of the different operating systems that you can target. The apps are single binaries, which means when you put them onto a system, they're going to run. You don't need to find that DLL or the library that you're missing or do a system update for anything like this to be possible. You're getting native performance. So everything that I've said right up to now might be possible to do through HTML, some JavaScript, if you've got the, the right libraries installed. But it might not be a good performance, might not be the user experience you're looking for. So we're talking about native applications that run as though they were written dedicated to the platform you're running on. It's built using best practice in techniques and language setup. So you feel productive, you have a great time from the offset. And really, this is lowering the barrier to building graphical user interfaces. <clears throat> and we get to promote good engineering principles at the same time. Makes me feel warm and fuzzy inside. And I think it really helps people coming to this for the first time to learn how things can be done well. And so this is where the fine project comes in. 
I started it four and a half years ago with all of these design principles in mind, giving folk a chance to get started and get started fast. Our underli underlying aim is to be the simplest toolkit for building beautiful and usable native graphical applications for desktop and beyond. And these are applications that you will write once and will be able to run on any device. If you've not heard about the Find Toolkit, which is uh, understandable, especially if you've not been working with Go, you can see here it has been growing faster than anything for Go before. It's more popular than any of the competing projects out there. And so if you're thinking about doing anything in this area, Find is absolutely where you want to be at. Now I'm going to step you through a whole bunch of code. I hope most of it makes sense, but it'll show you with a limited number of lines how you can get up and running super fast. I've got a few images in here. Apart from this one, all of the photos have come from Unsplash. And I don't know if they're all truly gophers, but I know this one is. He's called Gophy. And if you've ever gone to a Go uh, meetup or conference, you'll have seen a ton of these around. Um, most people have a collection of them, but, but he is mine and he supervises. This time he's going to show us how to build a Hello World application. Now, if you're getting started for the first time on your computer, you will need a Go compiler. They've just released, I think, 119, but we work back to 114 um, mostly because it supports some older devices and it's in all the Linux distributions um, by default. And we're working with graphics, so you're going to need a C compiler, I'm afraid. If you're a developer and you're at an open source conference, there's a good chance you have all of this set up and running already. It's just to be aware that some platforms have restrictions on how they build and you might need other tools um, available, but I will come back to what that means shortly. So we can set up our first project. I could live code this, but I'm just not that brave. So you would create a directory for the appropriate name, go into it, call go mod init and the name of your project. And that's just setting up essentially a module file. It's a new feature, but it allows us to keep track of our dependencies. And then you go get find.io slash find slash v2, and that is you up and running. And so now, assuming that Vim, Vim is your favorite text editor, others are available. I also recommend IDEs, but they don't look so good on the command line. We'll open our first Go file. Now, this should be pretty straightforward to follow. We have our package. It's called main. That's your entry point for any Go program. We're importing the app and widget sub packages from the Find project. And the main function is all that we need to create. We're starting a new application, assigning it to the variable A. We're opening a new window. We're calling it hello. This might be displayed on a title bar or some window decorations, depending on your operating system. So it's a good one to get right. And then we're setting the content of the window. Pretty straightforward here. We're creating a new label widget. And we're saying, hello, fine. And then we're calling the show and run method on window which is just a little helper for window show and application run. We can run this simply using the standard Go tools, Go run and this project. And you will see, perhaps unsurprisingly, a window appears with Hello Fine written in there. The title bar would say what you asked it to, but this window is very small because we're going to, by default, display just the right size to fit the content when you're on a desktop system because that's the way that things are typically set up. So there we go. It's, it's in a light theme because, as you can see, the operating system is currently in light, but it will adapt to your user configuration, theme, font size, those sorts of things. So that was simple, straightforward. The application will work on any device that you have the compilers for, but our gopher expected more. I don't imagine you came all the way up or down two or three flights of stairs to see how to write Hello World, especially not if you want um, the air conditioning for another 25 minutes. So instead, I thought, let's build a text editor. I mean, everybody's got to build a text editor, right? It's the first step towards building an IDE, which, of course, is the ambition of surely any user interface developer. And so we're going to put all of the code necessary to, to build this application. And I'm going to do so in the next 10 minutes. We'll start with something very familiar. It's our main package. It's got an entry point called main, and we have similar imports. This time, we've not touched widgets yet, but we are importing the root package, the, the one that looks like it's called v2, but that's just a, a, a versioning semantic. The package is actually called fine, as you can see is the, the, in the path before it. And so we're creating an app. This time, we're setting the window to be called text edit because I am just feeling that uniquely inspired. 
We're creating a user interface in a function that we've not defined yet called make UI, and we're assigning it to the UI variable and passing that into set content. Nothing to see here, really. The big change in this function is that we're calling resize on the window. With years of experience and reflecting, we probably should have called that request resize or request size because some operating systems like your mobile device are going to say, nope, it needs to be bigger or it needs to be smaller. Um, but in this case, we're going to ask for that size because it feels about right for a text editor. And these are device independent coordinates, sorry, dimensions. And on a platform that won't resize to that size, if you ask for huge and the screen's only so small, it will do the best to adapt. So let's look at the user interface itself. Everything that you saw there was a standard widget and from the widget package that we used before. The main area that we're editing, we're going to create a variable called entry, and it is a new multi-line entry. I don't have prizes to give away, but somebody would probably get that that is an entry line that has multiple lines in it. For the status bar at the bottom, we've got two fields that we want to update, the row and the column. So we're creating two labels there, they both have one as the fallback, uh, default content. And we're going to add a toolbar as well. So we're going to create a function called build toolbar. Probably wouldn't have got any prizes for guessing what this is going to do either. And here we're just simply returning a new toolbar, again, from the standard widget package. Each item in the toolbar is an action. It has an icon and it has a function call. And with Go, we can simply tell them the name of the function and it will invoke that later. So when the uh, toolbar button is pressed, the action invokes. And we'll look at the details of some of those actions later. And we're putting a little separator in there as well. So that's perhaps a few lines more than you would want on a Hello World. But I think you can clearly see that each line of this is doing one thing and it's doing it quite clearly. And that's how we're aiming to keep the API clean and simple for the entire toolkit. So to complete the definition of this user interface, we need to build a layout. And this comes in two parts. So our status bar at the bottom is an independent layout. It wants to flow horizontally along. We're using an H box, a horizontal box, which is designed to pack the widgets tightly together, but of equal height, so we get a nice uniform feel. So we're creating some, some anonymous labels here because we don't need to interact with them. We're saying cursor row is the, then the label for cursor row. And the column is going to be that label that we created earlier for representing the column. And then lastly, we use what is probably the most powerful and sometimes overlooked container and layout for fine. And that is the border. So we can set items around the edges and then something in the center. So we have the toolbar at the top, the status bar at the bottom. We have nothing left and right. And instead, because Go doesn't really do name parameters to constructors, we just pass nil. And then we pass a new scroll for the entry. And that's going to mean that the content can be scrolled. And as I look at it, I think, ah, but we put scrolling into the multi-line entry only in the last release. So this code is out of date and we could have just passed that multi-line entry widget. And you run it and you get this. It's something that looks like a working text editor. And I did in fact work. This is, did right, this is a working text editor into the multi-line entry there. You can see the cursor row and column haven't been updated and that's not a surprise we haven't wired them up. But it looks like an application that we designed earlier. And running on our Mac, this is probably what you would expect. But then I thought, well, let me put it on my iPhone with no changes to the code and just on a platform that Apple has agreed is licensed to install onto an iOS device because sometimes people own the platforms that you want to deploy to. Um, we were able to uh, build that application and install it. And I'll show you how to do that shortly as well. But there you go, that's the same UI adapted as you would expect to a different modality of device. But what about that data? It technically works, but it's not going to really be a functional application until we're able to work with files on the system. Now there's a fair bit of code in here and I don't really want to step into the details of it, especially if you're not avid Go developers who want me to justify why I've taken a certain path. But what you can see is the first section there is opening a dialogue. It's a file, sorry, it's a show file open call. So it's going to create a file open dialogue and show it. The function that we pass in is a callback for when the user has finished interacting. So we check that there was 
no error occurred in opening the file that the user requested. It can happen. So we would then use another helper, show error, in the dialog package, which is going to, again, no prizes, show an error to the user. If there was no error, we'll continue. But if there was no reader, the user could have cancelled it, changed their mind. So we need to make sure that we're not forcing them to open a file. So we can return there if nothing has happened. The rest of it is just a little bit of Go code that's reading all the data from a stream. If there is no error doing so, we will make sure to close it because we're done. And we're just setting the text by the string representation of the data that was read. I'm not going to go into that, but as you can see, it's fairly straightforward. And we're going to save the URI, the resource identifier for the file that we open for later. And if anything went wrong, we'll show another error because we're not doing particularly sophisticated error handling here. Pretty straightforward opening in general. Save as, kind of the same, but inverse. We take the content of the widget, which is entry.txt, and we write that out to a file that the user has requested. And then we have save which is just a small uh, improvement over save as, because like I showed before, we were re remembering the URI of the file that we opened in saved URI. So we're just going to try and write the data out to that same location again. Of course, if any ha error has happened, we'll show an error dialog. Now, this is going to result in a file dialog such as this. This is the find provided fallback. We don't have a platform specific dialog that we think we should be opening. And it's perfectly functional. Users can browse their files and pick something to open and save. Now, you might be thinking, goodness, that was a strange amount of work to go and just read a file. I've used fopen in the past, for example. But we're doing this for a reason, because file systems are actually a fairly um, rigid definition and not necessarily present on every operating system. Your phone may have a file system, but when you write an app for it, you're not really getting access to all of that data in the traditional format. So the approach that we took using URIs instead of file paths means that we can interact with data that's been selected by the user that might not be a file system. So the same app on my iPhone, when I say open a file, I'm going into iOS's native picker and it's allowing me to choose files on the file system or on my cloud drive. And in the same way, you can ask for data or be passed it from another application. So I could be interacting with a file in my Dropbox app that's been temporarily made available to the application. So once again, we're just solving complicated challenges before you realize that they're going to be a problem for you. And lastly, let's just wire up the callbacks there. So we want to update the cursor row and column. We create a little function called update status, which does that. It sets the text for each of those labels and the text is just an integer to string conversion from properties on the entry. It knows where the cursor is. And apart from being zero indexed, that's pretty simply just copying the data into the user interface. And when the user has changed their cursor, there is an on cursor changed callback. So you'll find many widgets have on something and you can set functions in there to be executed when these events occur. And all of this is completely thread safe as well. We haven't mentioned threading once and you really don't need to. All of this is going to work and you can then add your own background handling or complex things happening alongside the user interface. And one last thing I, I really wanted to add to this application to make it feel complete. The title bar should clearly show an asterisk if you're editing a file and you haven't saved it. In the future, you might wire that into a don't exit, don't close the window. Are you sure here's an opportunity to save? But we don't want to be using global variables and saving state and interacting with it. So we've introduced data binding. So this is like a piece of a variable in memory that you then can monitor for changes and passing around the handle, different parts of the application can respond. So we set up a new Boolean, a true or false state with binding. And in our main method, underneath um, the code, but before we run the application, we've added this listener. It's just a simple anonymous data listener that's going to say, what is the current value? And if this has been edited, because that's the state we're representing, we'll put a little asterisk at the name, at the end of the title for our title bar. That's all the setup we need. In the place that owns how the window is presented, we have the code that manages it. And in the state of the application where we're actually making changes and reading data, we can set the value of this data binding. So if somebody 
changes something, the on changed is cold, we set true into the data binding, and when they save, we set false. We don't need to know that the window is responding to that event, we just pass that new data. And so there we have it, our complete text editor application, all of this running completely on any platform that you choose. We're done. We added a question mark, the asterisk went on, but we could have done more. Time is a little limited, so I'm not going to just go ahead and do this right now, but we could have put a main menu in there. It's similar to toolbars, you pass some metadata in, some actions, and it will populate on a Mac OS, it will appear right at the top as part of the native bar. On other systems, it will appear in the window. And on a mobile, there's a what's called the burger bun, I guess, pops in from the side. Well, it's doing the right thing for the platform. We could set up a system tray menu. Maybe overkill in this case, but it could be useful. If you want to see more about what the toolkit can do and all of the widgets available, rather than have me slideshow all of them, you can check it out. There's a fine demo application as part of the repository. And if you've done the prerequisites, you can go install that line there, which is in the slide, which is shared. I'm not going to, to read it out for the folk at home. Now, I said this was easy to, to get out there and put on any devices. So let's just touch briefly on the testing and distribution of these applications. I think these are gophers and they're clearly sharing something. So we're good. I mentioned at the beginning that Go has unit testing baked right in. This is hugely beneficial to the robustness of the software that it creates. And we thought it needs to be embraced in the user interface as well. And so next time somebody says, well, the test coverage is low there because it's a graphical user interface, you can say, whoa, let's just put that assumption aside and think, are we using the right tools? Because building with the appropriate technologies and techniques, we can have unit testing baked right into everything that we build at the front end as well. Now there's some, uh, boilerplate here, which is setting up a unit test in Go. We have a, some, some imports up there. I like to use Testify as a cert package because the built-in one feels a little bit uh, weak, but other than that, it's a standard unit test with no add-ons. We have a method called test text selected. So any function in, the test, in, in a, a code package that starts with test and takes a parameter of the testing.t, which is a, a context for, for test handling, Again, it's a little boilerplate -y, but it's pretty easy to learn. That basically, the only thing you need to know to make a unit test. So we're going to test that the text is selected appropriately. So we're creating an um, entry widget. This would probably be part of the application, a variable that you have saved into the state like we did before. But here we're just setting it um, for a simple standalone test. And we have a test package in fine that helps to simulate certain user input if you're wanting to um, have it appear that the user took actions rather than do it all in literal code. And so we're, we're having it type the word hello into the entry. Then we can use the assert package to check that the text of the entry is in fact the text hello. No surprises there, that's probably going to pass. But then we can do a little bit more. We can say, well, the user is now going to double tap on the entry. What's going to happen here? Well, the, the text should be selected because they've you know, indicated that they want the current word. And so then we say, is the selected text now hello? Um, and it is if the test's passing. And we can also check that the cursor moved on to the end of the word by checking that five is now the cursor column. Now that might not seem fundamentally huge, but it's clearly validating certain behaviors that we might just have coded into this entry widget. And what's really important is that this text test can be run using the same Go standard tools. We've edited our test file and we run it with Go test. Really straightforward. Now, if anybody's been building user interfaces with the web or, or other um, technologies where you have a test driver, it loads the application and takes control of your mouse and keyboard and you sit there while somebody freakishly fast moves around your screen, you'll be reassured to know that this is completely running in memory. There's no user interface popping up. There is nothing that's taking control of your screen. This knows how things should work, how they should render, but it doesn't need to present it to you. We have a driver in there that is going to run what is called headless. The application runs completely, but in memory. You can take snapshots of the state if it's important to your testing, but you don't need to relinquish control of your computer. 
Now let's get into packaging and distribution. So we have a helpful tool called Fine. It's in addition to the library. It's a little command line tool that you can install. And that's just the parameters there for getting the latest version of it. And if you're using Fine and uh, uh, building your applications over time, do keep this up, up to date. It can be very helpful sometimes. New functionality might need the helper tool up to date as well as the library. Now we're going to run Fine Package. Now we've run the code. Already it's appeared on screen and we've had a window, but it might not look like an application that you're familiar with because it's essentially running a command line uh, tool like any other Go application might be. Find package, on the other hand, is going to create an application bundle or whatever is appropriate for your operating system so that you can drag and drop icons, double click them, and it has all of the metadata that you would expect. By default, that's working for the current operating system. If you want to build for somebody else's, then just specify the operating system you're targeting. Because, find, uh, because Go understands all of these different compiling targets, most of this is completely automatic. Most of this is completely automatic. And so here we could build a, a Linux um, bundle instead. So that's probably going to be a TarGZ with all of the metadata appropriate to, to install onto a computer. But if you're just doing it for yourself, packaging, yeah, I mean, it's nice, but then I have to go and drag it and do something. So we added a, a command called install. And so if you call install, it's just going to take the application, bundle it, and then put it into the right place for your OS, which here on my Mac, um, it is put it into the applications folder. I did this with find settings. So then if I search set, it's going to find the application. You can see the metadata and the version um, icon and so forth is present. With my iOS device plugged in and appropriate Apple certificate signed, I can do exactly the same for my iPhone. I just install dash OS iOS, and it's going to push that down the cable onto my device. And here you can broadly see that there is a group of apps called Fine that has got a bunch of my favorite applications, and they've all just been coded in exactly the way that you've seen before. The metadata is bundled. The app is something that iOS understands natively, and it's going to install like any other application. Now, I mentioned most of this happens automatically, and earlier I mentioned that compile C compilers are required to connect to graphic stack. And if you want to build for iOS, you need Xcode. And if you want to build for Android, you need the Android SDK setup. If that sounds a little bit difficult, but you're quite happy to have Docker installed, then we have a containerized solution as well called FineCross that was very generously donated to the community by one of our team. And that is going to have essentially the same commands but instead of looking at local tools, it's going to download an image, um, run it in a Docker instance. It's going to take your code, mount it into the developer tools container, do the work, put your application back onto your file system and shut it down. So you don't have to manage the installs, but you get the same benefit. So it's worth looking at if you're not so familiar with managing compilers and versions and so forth. Distribution is a little bit more complex. The package that I just showed you can be shared with your friends. It could be copied onto other computers. It's uh, relocatable and independent in the way that a single binary application from Go is as well. But sometimes you want to work with folk who don't know what to do with that icon, or you might want to have it on the store. So here we're looking at how would we um, then set up an application for release. I'm demonstrating that sometimes there's a little bit more metadata needed such as an app ID. If we're sending this out to uh, Windows or Mac OS or iOS, they need a little bit more metadata that they can use to uniquely identify your software when it goes into the store. So we pass that into the release command, which is often going to generate something similar to package, but with a little bit more data, perhaps a different format structure certification. It's just going to do the right thing. On iOS, we can do exactly that but we need to say, Apple has given me this certificate. This is the profile that's been set up to allow me to distribute. I'm not going to go into what either of those things mean. Suffice to say, there's documentation, and if you're getting into building and shipping onto iOS, you will be able to find lots about it, and that will mean something by the time you get there. On Android, we could do the same. We just need to tell it where our password was stored. Some of these things are repetitive, Potentially, the command line arguments would lead to issues when being replicated again and again. So we added a file format here, a little TOML file called Fine App. And so you can store these, put it into your repository, and it means that these then become optional parameters that you could override or you can just omit completely. 
and your build number will just get incremented by the, the tooling as well to help you out just a little bit with the release process. Finance in the wild. Sorry, I find him very in intense there. It gets me, gets me motivated to show all of the amazing things that people have been doing with Fine. Sadly, I can't show you everything that people have been doing with Fine. There's too much, which is an amazing problem, but uh, one nonetheless we have to live with. Um, Apps.fine.io is the place to go for a showcase of all of the open source apps that are currently known and people want to share. There's a selection of some here. We have uh, a file sharing secure platform up on the top left. Bottom left is one of my favorites, actually. It's a little uh, medical uh, imaging viewer. This is running on a Raspberry Pi and a $50 touchscreen off Amazon, but you wouldn't know it from the performance that you get from something that's built natively from the ground up to be uh, efficient in this way. So that's pretty cool. A music player in the center there was written by one of our collaborator, uh, core contributors, sorry, um, which I just completely love the look of. And somebody contributed a uh, Gordle, a Wordle clone for Go, in case that uh, wasn't, wasn't quite fitting into your pun um, mindset. That's, that's pretty cool, actually. So I, I, I got back into Wordle after somebody contributed that. Very faithful clone, I think, of the original. Uh, top right there, there's a little version of the text editor that I showed you today. It's taken out the toolbar so this, uh, and, and the status bar, so it's a little bit simpler. But actually, that entire application is simply done with under 20 lines of code because we understand Markdown as a definition of rich text. And so the two are connected with the data callback, much like I showed you before. When somebody changes the text, we parse the Markdown. Um, so that's another great example. In fact, there's a seven-minute lightning talk of going from nothing to a Markdown editor in the store uh, at uh, GopherCon last year, I believe. And then I was working on a cross-platform chat application with a cross-platform GUI technology. And that is showing WhatsApp, Telegram, Discord, all connected to one system that is going to, as you might guess, run on any device that, they, that you choose to build it for. I wouldn't recommend using that every day. It's a proof of concept and uh, QR code security systems um, and some uh, improvements to be made show that it's a, a technology preview, really. Of course, this is just the stuff that's open source. There's so much more right there in the wild. People have been using this in production. There are remote desktop uh, companies that have used it as a streaming solution and so many more that I wish that I could uh, go into. Uh, but people get to keep this to themselves. They build internal tools and they keep them there. But true to being at LinuxCon and the Open Source Summit, we have a desktop environment. It's called FindDesk, like I said, complete genius with naming. And that has all the functionality you'd expect to manage your applications, menus, and in the screenshot on the right there, we also have an application for discovering these applications. Built in fine, as you might expect, and it will allow you to install all of the applications that you can find on that website with one tap. At the moment it requires developer tools installed, we're working on a binary distribution system for that. And we have a, a terminal. Any guesses on its name? Fine term. Exactly. You, yeah, I named that one too. <laughs> so a, 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 a terminal emulator. This is going to work on everything. Uh, it may not be the most elegant or performant terminal in the world yet, but it works on anything. And so I wanted to build an SSH client. So I put an SSH wrapper on the in, in between the user interface and the um, shell. Package a login screen with it. And it works on iOS and Android, and it's available in the stores. The terminal widget is just another widget in Fine. It's not in the core repository, it's in an additions. But because Go just allows you to import code from anywhere that's open source, you say, I would like a terminal in here. And it's in your code with one line, and you have a terminal embedded in your user interface. And up on the top left there, I did actually get created with this one. Um, it's called Fin. It's the Fine login manager. Sorry. Occasionally, these things, you know, they just come to you. Anyway, um, as I think that's probably an old version now, but it's, it's allowing you to have a, a, a fully fine experience from booting your graphics through to your, your full desktop environment. And there is an early days Linux distribution called Fishos, spelled with a Y. Um, okay, the story of that name is probably a little bit older, uh, but it, it's aiming to have 
a, a, Linux, a Linux experience that doesn't rely on the presence of the libraries for Qt or GTK and all of their dependencies because these are single binary applications with no dependencies. So we're, we're pushing towards a really, really lightweight desktop. Uh, but because we haven't re-implemented your, your uh, Wi-Fi chooser and your file manager yet, there are still a few things that we're trying to, to get out of there. But it's coming along nicely. Thank you so much for your attention. If you would like to know more, because there is plenty more, you can go to our main documentation. It's at developer.find.io. Or we have a YouTube channel, which is full of uh, getting started tutorials and uh, all sorts of random things that we've, we've thrown in there that, that, that folk are enjoying. And we have a annual conference that's been online until this year. And we put all of our videos up there as well. So you can get to see the state of the union over the years. Uh, I did write a book, Building Cross-Platform GUI Applications with Fine. It's available in actually many good bookstores. I'm quite surprised. Uh, but that's an, an opportunity there to step through from the very beginning all the way to distributing your applications in an awful lot more detail than I was able to give you here. And depending on your platform, it will step through the installation steps. There's appendices for managing those build tools that I completely glossed over today, which will be helpful if you're getting started for the very first time. There was a precursor to this book, which was looking at all of the different ways you can build graphical apps with Go. Um, I wrote that one too, and you might not be surprised to say that to, to find that I found that, that our platform was the easiest to use. So you can you can skip over that one. But if you're looking for a comparison about Qt, GTK, and other um, Go specific technologies, there's another book out there. We absolutely would love more contributions, people getting involved in the community, however it is. Um, just, just come along. The main project is at that URL on GitHub. All of our websites are open source on projects on GitHub. We have um, uh, contributors from, from all over the world. I think 120 people so far are getting involved, but one more is always a big deal. And we're loving contributions of code, new tests that keep us honest um, for a graphical platform, we're pretty proud to have a test coverage of about 68%, which is pretty pretty great considering the low level stuff that we're doing. I wish it could be higher, and it will over time, but it's getting there. Um, design, documentation, anything you think you could contribute. In fact, at the moment, uh, we're working on the next release, which has a, a graphic designer influence design improvement. So the stuff I've showed you um, is older, it's current, but it's a little out of date. We're going to release that in a few weeks or, or within the next month or so. Um, it still looks very similar, but it's polished and looks honestly like somebody designed it. Everything to this date has been material design with some engineer tweaks. And over time, that gets worse, not better, as I'm sure you can imagine. Uh, oh, sorry, we also do have plenty of um, channels. Pick your favorite server, essentially. We, um, we're on the Gophers. Slack, we have on the Gophers Discord, we have our own Discord server linked from the website and from the, the Gophers one. Um, I believe we're on Matrix, uh, but you might need to ping me if you want an answer on that one because it's a little quiet. And last of all, please do consider either sponsoring us yourselves, telling um, your work or your friends about the great work we're doing. When people see how much time and angst can be uh, removed or, or um, made more effective, efficient, and just happier using these tools. They um, love to feed, uh, love to give back. Um, of course, sponsorship makes it all possible, and um, so do your contributions. We love everybody in the community, and it's such a nice place to be. We see folk building their first graphical app. We see folk building their first piece of software ever. They come in, they have a chat, and they are. Well, the conversations that you're part of when somebody says, I've never coded before and I've got a phone app running. I was only doing this for two days. It's amazing to see those, to see those things. Do consider being part of the community or reach out to me directly. I'd be happy to take your questions, thoughts, all of these things. Um, but thank you so much for your, for your attention and yeah, enjoy the rest of OSS Summit as well if I don't get a chance to speak to you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, please. Um, so, do you have uh, so, so there's lots of widgets there. What's the situation if 
there isn't a widget that does what you need. Right, yeah, absolutely. So there's a good chance there isn't because there's all sorts of things that people are dreaming of doing. The standard widget package should capture the basics um, that, you know, there's, there's all sorts of different um, inputs, manipulators, um, ways to lay out your, your user interface. I, I recommend having a look at the, that uh, Find Demo app if you're curious. We also have an extensions repository that the community have contributed to, which is easier to put things into, but doesn't necessarily have the same production level code guarantees. And that has things like the um, uh, a map widget, graphing capabilities. I can't remember if the terminal is in there or if it's a third party um, uh, repository. But actually, the, the terminal is one of those examples where um, I, I, I just decided it would be a really helpful thing to do. And you can build any widget that you want out of Canvas primitives, which I didn't really speak about today. Um, but all of those widgets are built using a public API that you can use to build your own. Underlying the entire thing is a separate package called Canvas. Um, and that defines things like your text, um, lines, boxes, gradients, anything that, that should be, um, po sorry, all that you need to build any widget. And a piece of code that fulfills uh, an interface definition of widget is a widget um, and that simply says I am a canvas object which is the base level I could be drawn by the fine toolkit and um, here's my renderer because we encourage the separation of state and rendering uh, which is why you have a clean API and a widget but but a complex um, potential setup for how it would be displayed so you put your canvas manipulation code into the renderer and your widget state into the widget object and then uh, you use it like anything else. So instead of widget.newlabel, you would say my awesome widget package dot fantastic widget. Um, and then that gets dropped straight into your user interface like anything else. Um, and it will lay out according to the same rules and you can um, customize. A widget can say how big it must be, but beyond that, the context that's in is gonna to be told, hey, you can fill this space. Um, so yeah, there is actually nothing that can't be done in your own code that I've shown on screen. If you get into the depths, you might find some private packages, but they are purely optimizations, ways that we have avoided duplication of code in the system. It's not because there are certain things you can't do. Thanks. Cool. Well, uh, I think I'm probably standing between you and lunch then. Have a fantastic rest of the day. Thanks so much.